Hello everyone, I'm Jack Fisher and welcome to my world. And whenever a new Marvel movie is released, that world takes notice. And me being a lifelong comic book fan, how can it not? That being said, not all franchises are held in the same regard, nor are they held to the same standards. And for a franchise like Venom, everything is a little messier, literally and figuratively. And the same extends to its sequel, Venom Let There Be Carnage. Now let me start by saying I liked the first movie. Now it was a flawed movie, especially when compared to other Marvel movies, but it was also a fun movie. It was one of those movies that did a lot of things wrong and a lot of things right, but the things it did right definitely stood out more. Tom Hardy as Eddie Brock was perfectly cast. His take on the character was orders of magnitude better than what Topher Grace did in Spider-Man 3. He made Eddie the unscrupulous loser we all know and love, but he was also someone capable of making the right decisions, a persona that's perfectly in line with who he is in the comics. Plus, the dynamic between him and the alien symbiote was just so much fun. Naturally, I was plenty excited for a sequel. It was already teased by the post credit scene in the first movie, and it promised to give us Venom fighting Carnage, a spectacle that generations of Spider-Man fans have longed to see on the big screen. Admit it, even if you thought the first movie was crap, a part of you still wanted to see that fight. And that's exactly what we get with Venom Let There Be Carnage. Having seen the movie, I can confirm it delivers. And it's every bit as satisfying as you hope it is. Seriously, if you thought the Venom plot in Spider-Man 3 was a travesty, this movie is a perfect palate cleanser. But there's a lot more to talk about with this movie, and not just because of the extra juicy post credit scene at the end. There are some interesting facets at play here, so I'm going to offer my full review of the movie, as well as a little speculation about its implications. And to do so, I'll have to cover some major spoilers. While this movie wasn't big on mysteries or twists, there are some elements that go beyond the carnage. Now from the beginning, Venom Let There Be Carnage picks up where its predecessor left off. Eddie Brock is still trying to rebuild his life and his career as a reporter. At the same time, he's trying to manage his relationship with the alien symbiote he's hosting. And it's a volatile relationship to say the least. But before we learn the extent of that volatility, we meet Cletus Cassidy, played by Woody Harrelson. In a number of flashbacks, we see that Cletus isn't exactly a well-adjusted individual. He grew up at the Ravencroft Institute for the Criminally Insane. Having killed his grandmother, his mother, and animals, he's as criminally insane as you can get. But he's also in love, specifically with Francis Barrison, aka Shriek. It's not a healthy love to say the least, but like their comic book counterparts, they're both psychotic killers who don't mind spreading lots of carnage. In terms of romantic compatibility, it's a match made in hell. Unfortunately, being psychotic killers has kept them apart, mostly due to Shriek ending up in another prison and Cletus ending up on death row. But that's where Brock comes in. He's the only one Cletus is willing to talk to. As a result, Brock is the only one who can uncover the true breadth of Cletus's crimes. And, with some help from the symbiote, he succeeds. In the process, we see that Cletus's crimes are pretty damn horrific. The number of murders he committed was so egregious that California reinstitutes the death penalty just for him. By every measure, this is the last person you want getting an alien symbiote. But that's exactly what happens. And once again, it's Eddie Brock's fault. That was very much a common theme in the first movie. And it's still just as relevant in this movie. Eddie, blinded by ambition and short-sightedness, ends up giving Cassidy a taste of the symbiote. And he likes it. A lot. Now, the actual details aren't clear. And that's also an issue the first movie had. Being light on details and explaining how symbiotes actually work. But in the grand scheme of things, those details don't matter. All we, the audience, need to know is that a new symbiote was born from the interaction between Brock and Cassidy. And that symbiote wants two things. To reunite with Shriek, and to spread carnage. 
lots and lots of carnage. This is where things get messy again. It's bloody, it's violent, and it's pure psychotic madness, which Harrelson captures beautifully every step of the way. As a plot, it's not exactly complex, but it's still a whole lot of fun. However, Cassidy's violent rampage isn't the only source of action here. In fact, the first half of the movie is less about action and more about Brock's ongoing struggles with the symbiote. And it's a unique struggle, to say the least. On one hand, you have Eddie Brock trying to rebuild his life. But on the other, you have this alien symbiote who is impulsive, violent, and constantly trying to eat human brains. It's clear early on that they need each other to achieve their goals. That's a given since a symbiote, as an organism, needs a host to survive. But this movie doesn't frame that dynamic in such simplistic terms. Instead, it plays out more as a relationship. A volatile, abusive, and often destructive relationship. It's the kind of relationship that, if it were between two ordinary humans, it would definitely classify as domestic abuse. And you even get the sense that's intentional, because it gives context to what unfolds later on. You really could make the case that Venom Let There Be Carnage is less an action movie and more a relationship movie. And given how it ends, it might even qualify as romance, albeit a twisted, messy romance. But that relationship dynamic is actually critical. It doesn't just play out with Eddie and Venom. It also plays out with Cletus, Shriek, and the Carnage symbiote. Now make no mistake, none of these dynamics are stable. Not by a long shot. But the fact they're so unstable is what drives the story, as well as the action. And the difference in how Brock and Cletus navigate that instability is critical. Brock and Venom are not on the same page from the beginning. They keep wrestling for control, fighting one another to achieve their respective goals. And at one point, they separate for a while, an act that comes off as quarreling lovers, no less. But they eventually have to find their way back to one another. And a big reason they're able to do that is through Venom's supporting cast. This is where Anne, Eddie's former fiance from the first movie, once again shines. Now, even though she's been on the wrong side of Eddie's selfishness in the past, she still goes out of her way for him. Even her new fiance, Dan Lewis, finds a way to contribute. And while many of those contributions are somewhat generic, they still have the desired effect. They get Eddie and Venom on the same page in time to win the day. But again, it's really messy. By contrast, Cletus and Carnage start off perfectly in sync. They both want blood, violence, and chaos. And together, they achieve that to great effect. But as soon as Cletus's desires conflict with the symbiotes, things get volatile more so than they already are. That eventually proves to be their greatest vulnerability when confronting Venom and Brock. I won't spoil how the final clash unfolds, but that's mostly because words just cannot do it justice. How it plays out is so much bigger and bloodier than anything we got in Spider-Man 3. Even outside the context of the plot, it's beautifully done. In a sense, the final confrontation is a reflection of their respective relationships only one that happens to be falling apart, and one where both parties are trying to make it work. Again, it sounds a lot like a romance, and not in a subtle way either, but it's also very much in keeping with the lore of the comics. And it's one of those details I didn't expect this movie to capture. You see, in the comics, symbiotes don't just bond with their hosts. Sometimes they actually fall in love with them. It's true. These alien globs are capable of love. They don't love all their hosts, but when they find one that's special, they really connect with it. Sure, it's not the same kind of love you'd see in a typical chick flick, but it's still love. It nicely reflects the evolution of Eddie and Venom's connection throughout the movie. What began in the first movie has matured in this one, and it had to mature in order to defeat Carnage. Again, that process was messy, and a bit incoherent at times. Many of the same flaws from the first movie are still present in this one. From the pacing, to the dialogue, to the overall flow of the story, it lacks the usual polish we've come to expect from Marvel movies. 
but it still works. And this leads me to the post credit scene. Because even if you didn't like the movie, you can't deny that post credit scene was a doozy. Not just for what happened, but for the larger implications. Without delving too much into the finer details, it effectively teases us something that Spider-Man fans have been pining for. A meeting between Tom Hardy's Venom and Tom Holland's Spider-Man. Now, why this hasn't happened sooner is a longer story. One involving movie rights, studio politics, and plenty of other complications that I'm not equipped to explain. All you need to know is that this post credit scene makes it official. Venom and Spider-Man are now in the same universe. They can interact. And that's big. Now the how and the why of this revelation is a bit trickier. There's a strong implication that Venom and Spider-Man were not in the same universe before this scene. Then there's a strange occurrence, something that appears to be cosmic in nature. Now could it be due to the events of Loki? Could it be due to the events of Avengers Endgame? Or is this something we'll have to see play out in Spider-Man No Way Home? It's not clear at this point, but it has plenty of fans curious and excited, myself included. But as a standalone movie, Venom Let There Be Carnage is one of those movies that just delivers what it promises. It still has flaws, most of which were carried over from the first movie, but I still say it's an improvement, which is something we want in any sequel. This movie doesn't try to reinvent the superhero genre. It doesn't try to redefine a character or revolutionize the art of filmmaking. It moves quickly, avoids complexity, and gives the audience exactly what they want. And now that it has set the stage for a clash with Spider-Man, the future for Eddie Brock and Venom is nothing short of spectacular. Thanks for watching, everyone. And thanks for joining me in my world. Please remember to like, comment, and subscribe. And until next time, take care and stay safe.